Hey guys, in this video, I'll dust off the memories of this trusty workhorse called HP ProDesk 600G3. This machine, powered by Intel's reliable processors, offered a balance of performance and efficiency that catered to the professional's needs. Its compact size and various form factors made it versatile, fitting neatly into any workspace while delivering the power required for everyday tasks. But what about today? Can the ProDesk 600G3 keep up with the demands of modern computing? The answer lies in the exciting opportunities for upgrades that have emerged over the years. I'll explore how adding more memory can enhance multitasking. Swapping in a solid state drive can breathe new speed into the system and even consider the potential for adding a dedicated graphics card for gaming. The HP ProDesk 600G3 is a commercial grade desktop computer that is part of HP's ProDesk series. This series is designed for business and professional users who require reliable and efficient computing solutions for their work environments. The G3 in the model name indicates that it's the third generation of the ProDesk 600 series and it was likely released around 2017 or 6 years ago. This makes the system old, but not that old, thanks to which it has DDR4 memory and front-facing USB Type-C for connecting and charging modern devices. The ProDesk 600G3 comes in various form factors, including traditional tower, small form factor, and mini desktop configurations. These different form factors allow for flexibility in terms of space utilization and deployment options. The unit today is Micro Tower. You can see it next to the bigger Lenovo Think Center M83 and Dell Precision T, which are towers. I like the smaller design. The HP team have optimized the space inside the case very well. There is place for everything and easy ways to maintain and upgrade the system. The ProDesk 600 comes with an Intel LGA 1151 motherboard. The socket is famous with its two distinct versions. The first revision, which supports both Intel's Skylake and Kaby Lake CPUs, and the second revision, which supports Coffee Lake CPUs exclusively. The CPU in this PC is a low-end Pentium G4500 using the Skylake architecture. It has two cores and operates at 3.5 GHz. Very basic chip for basic tasks. The RAM is just one stick of 8 GB. No dedicated GPU is present. No SSD too, just a slow HDD. The power supply is 250 Watt with Platinum Efficiency label. In general, OK PC for light work, but I want to upgrade it to a gaming PC. I ran few benchmark tests for future comparisons. You can see the results on your screen. Nothing to brag about. OK, it's time for the more interesting part, upgrading all the major components, CPU, RAM, drive, and GPU. For the video card, I need to take into account some restrictions. The power supply is just 250 watts. It doesn't have enough power for a very powerful GPU, and it doesn't have the necessary cables to connect it. Another limitation is the case. It's small, but it will be quite enough, because the video card I have chosen is small in size. Let's start with the easiest upgrade, the SSD. Using a hard drive for a main drive should be considered a crime these days. I don't think there is anyone here who is not familiar with the advantages of SSD over HDD. Installing the SSD is easy. One cable from the motherboard and one from the power supply. I am installing a 240GB SSD. Nothing fancy, just a cheap and fast disk. The next easy update is the memory, adding a second stick of 8GB RAM to total of 16. Dual channel memory configuration is generally better for performance compared to single channel memory in a PC. Dual channel memory is a memory architecture that allows the computer's memory controller to access two memory modules simultaneously, effectively doubling the data transfer rate between the memory and the memory controller. It's important to note that in order to take advantage of dual channel memory benefits, you need to install memory modules in pairs of matching capacity and speed. The next upgrade is the CPU, which requires removing the CPU cooler. I bought a Kaby Lake Core i5-7500. I think the Core i5 is a good balance between price and performance. The CPU has four cores, operating at 3.4 GHz by default. 
but can boost up to 3.8 GHz. It is much faster than the previous Pentium, and it has faster integrated GPU. While the Pentium G4500 has a HD 530 graphics, the Core i5-7500 has a HD 630. But why am I even talking about integrated graphics? The motherboard is with Q270 chipset, which is designed for KB Lake CPUs. It has 4 memory slots with a total maximum capacity of 64GB RAM. This is one of the better chipsets for Kaby Lake. It supports RAID, Intel Active Management, Trusted Execution and vPro technology. Let's install a dedicated GPU now. My weapon of choice is a NVIDIA GTX 1050 Ti, a mid-range graphics card from NVIDIA's 10 series lineup of graphics cards, which is designed to provide a good balance between performance, power efficiency and affordability. It is based on NVIDIA's Pascal architecture, which was a significant leap in performance and power efficiency compared to the previous generation. The GTX 1050 Ti offers a significant performance improvement over integrated graphics solutions and older graphics cards. It should be capable of handling modern games at 1080p resolution with reasonable settings. One of the strengths of the GTX 1050 Ti is its relatively low power consumption. It doesn't require external power. The PCI Express connector on the motherboard, in which the video card is placed, can provide a maximum of 75 watts of power, and it's enough. I found this card on eBay. I didn't know that HP had OEM variants of this GPU. It is probably from a HP Pavilion gaming PC. I find it strange that it is red. NVIDIA main color is green. HP gaming branded products also bet on green. And most importantly, red is a color that is associated with the main competitor, AMD Radeon. But let's move on to the tests. In every benchmark tested, the differences are big. This should not surprise us, but I still decided to show exact numbers. The Core i5-7500 has more cores, more threads, higher base and turbo clock speeds, and larger cache size, which further improves performance by reducing the time it takes for the CPU to access frequently used data. On the other hand, the Core i5-7500 has a higher power consumption compared to the Pentium G4500 due to its higher performance capabilities. The first one is Forza Horizon 5. The game recently received a big and long-awaited update that brought back some interest from both old and new players. The average FPS with low quality preset is around 60. The 4GB video memory of the card is perfectly sufficient for this game with these settings. In the next minutes you can see results from few built-in game benchmarks. All the tests are with 1080p resolution. After the bench, I included a little bit of gameplay with Fortnite and GTA 5. If you are interested in more game results, I think my next video to be specifically aimed at 1050Ti and to include the full length of the benchmarks and more captured gameplay. The next game is Cyberpunk. It has high expectations from the hardware and the average FPS with low preset is just 35. I don't think this is a good result for comfortable gaming with first person shooter game, but the result is not unexpected. The next game is Tomb Raider. With medium preset the FPS is around 40. Far Cry 6 is the newest game here. It was released less than a year ago. The graphics preset is low and the result is 49 FPS. I've got a low video memory size warning. The game may crash because of this.
I'm gonna be using your car. Oh! oh! You lucky, buddy. In conclusion, I can say that the computer provides a good basis for an inexpensive upgrade. You can find it easily on sites like eBay with different configurations and cheap prices. The lack of DDR3 memory is good. The prices of DDR4 RAM and SSDs are cheap now. The second hand processors are not expensive too. A little more attention should be paid to the video card. Be careful about the power supply as well as the physical dimensions of the card. The airflow in the case is also not great, but for lower end components I think it will be enough. By low end I mean we are not talking about NVIDIA 3080 type cards and newer. And we're not talking about 4K gaming.